What do you say to California who says this rule is arbitrary? Well, I, I can't say it's terribly surprising. I mean, this is a thousand page rule. Uh, I'd be willing to bet, and I'm not a betting man, that they haven't read it front hmm. to back. And, and, and while not everybody has to read it, if you're going to file a lawsuit, you need to know what you're filing a lawsuit on. This rule is well within the boundaries of the law and the legal tradition. I mean, Nancy Pelosi referred to America's proud heritage. Yeah. Self-sufficiency is a central part of America's proud heritage. And we proudly stand behind that tradition and enforce the 1996 law passed on a wildly bipartisan basis yep. and signed by Bill Clinton. Um, and uh, in 1999, they started this process under the Clinton administration, at, but they never introduced a rule. They said they were going to and never did. And so this is, we've been operating on fairly dormant guidance for a hmm. long time. This. This rule is well within the law. I'm very confident that we'll prevail in those lawsuits. Um, this has been very thoroughly vetted, and it broke records, shattered records in the Department of Homeland Security for public comments, 266,000. And we went to great lengths to respond to those comments and made significant changes to the rules based on the public input. Okay, so let me let me give an example because I know with all of this, and obviously you're a lawyer, and sometimes it can it can become easy to become lost as as one's reading through this. As you point out, it's a thousand pages. Um, so so I I just wanted to give you an example of a situation so that you could respond to it and tell me what you think. Uh, the HUD Secretary, Ben Carson, who obviously is a, a noted neurosurgeon, now a member right. of the cabinet, wrote in his book, by the time I went into ninth grade, mother had made such strides that she received nothing except food stamps. She couldn't have provided for us and kept up the house without that subsidy. Now, obviously, that's someone you know. So he went from being on food stamps to becoming a neurosurgeon, presidential candidate, and right. member of the United States cabinet. So under your rules, an immigrant whose child could theoretically be a Ben Carson, would not be allowed to come into the United States in the first place. Why? Well, of course, of course, you're talking about people who were American citizens who are getting the benefit of welfare benefits American citizens provide. And people coming to this country um, have always been expected to be able to support themselves. That has overwhelmingly continued to be supported by the American people. And that's what this rule does. And that's all it does. Is it true that some people who do not, who are not in a position in the future to support themselves? So someone who's an immigrant like will, Ben, I mean, you are acknowledging be, that someone who's out. an immigrant in that situation would not be able to become Ben Carson. No, right? Aaron, I'm not, I, I won't ever judge a case because we talk so much about the welfare benefits, but that's only one factor. The career immigration services officers, we call them ISOs, that will make these case-by-case -case decisions uh, will consider all the factors Congress told us to consider, age, health, financial status, mm -hmm. assets, education, skills, family status as well. Those are all mandated by Congress. Yeah, you've always had to have had savings. Look, I understand <clears throat> the point that it's part of it. I'm just giving an example because I think it's helpful for people to understand that in that situation, someone who is an immigrant, legal, um, would not would not be here, right? If if this if this rule as you have it is enforced, I mean, you you say this is about self sufficiency, and you say that proudly. You heard me yeah. play you uh, this morning uh, when you quoted the Emma Lazarus poem on the Statue oh, of Liberty. Oh, I wasn't quoting it. I was answering a question. Right. Okay. I'm sorry, but you were giving your version of what you thought the poem should say, right? No. No, I was not. You said, "Give me your tired I was and your poor who can question. stand on." I'm not I rewriting poetry. Okay, I'm well, what I'm you said is, give policy. me your tired and your poor who can stand on their own two feet and who will not become a public charge. I just played you saying it. Right, I listened. Okay, okay, What's so I'm question? just making sure you're not just putting you said. Okay, so obviously the actual poem is quite different. I'm gonna read it. Right, I was answering a question. I wasn't writing poetry, Aaron. Don't don't change the facts. I, I'm not changing the, the facts, you, I'm just you're saying. You're twisting this no, like no, no, everybody no, no, else no, no. on the left no, no, has no, done all day today. No, 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 because I think it's today. important. You're saying that it's very important to be able to stand on your own two feet. A lot yes, of people may support you and respect your saying that, but the poem doesn't say that, right? The poem that's I didn't on the bring Statue up of the Liberty. Poem. I didn't bring up the poem. Well, you, An NPR reporter did, and now you have. Okay, I didn't bring it up. I'll answer okay. your substantive intelligence so questions. So I'm going to give Please you a substantive intelligence. Okay, Who, however it came up, you said, give me your tired and your poor, okay? Who can stand on their own two feet and who will not become a public charge. That's what you right. said. I just played it. The poem reads, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of the teeming shore. Send these, the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Wretched, 
poor refuse, right? That's what the poem says America's supposed to stand for. So what do you think America stands for? Well, of course, that poem was referring back to people coming from Europe where they had class-based societies where people were considered wretched if they weren't in the right class. And it was introduced, it was written one year, one year after the first federal public charge rule was written that says, and I'll quote it, any person unable to take care of himself without becoming a public charge, unquote, would be inadmissible. Or in the terms that my agency deals with, uh, they can't do what's called adjusting status, getting a green card, becoming legal permanent residents. Same exact time, Aaron, same exact time. In the year it went on the Statue of Liberty, 1903, another federal law was passed expanding the elements of public charge yeah. by Congress. This is a. I mean, when my family came here, they came here as, as crofters as from Scotland, right? They, could, they had no education, they had nothing. Right. But I am here because they were allowed in. <laughs> And I'm an anchor on CNN, right? right. So I'm just and saying I, I wouldn't be here. My Italian grandfather sponsored his two cousins to come here. This is a tradition that many of our families, yours and mine, can point to. Right. This is not an exclusionary. Uh, no, no. Uh, but what I'm saying is, I would have been excluded. I don't know about you, but I, I would have been. Well, no, that's not. You're, you're deciding on one point. And our ISOs are going to take what's called a totality of the circumstances test, which has been long been the test for public charge. And this will be one factor. It will be a heavily negative factor. But they can have positive factors that offset that as well, just as has happened throughout American history. Okay. And I, I should note also, yep. this doesn't apply to any of the humanitarian um, not categories. To asylum. Yes. Not to asylum, refugees, that is true. domestic violence. Uh, trafficking victims, none of them are covered by the public charge rule. Okay, so I want to play for you the video. You've heard it before, you've seen it, but but I think you can shed some light on the situation as it is. The 11-year-old girl named Magdalena, right? Her father was rounded up during the immigration raids in Mississippi last week. Here's the soundbite that everyone in this country has now seen. Here she is. I need my dad for me. <laughs> <laughs> my dad didn't do nothing. He's not a criminal. So Magdalena, her mother, uh, got a hold of her father today about a week after uh, that happened. Can you explain, Director, what the crime was that her father committed? Was it simply just being in the United States um, well, of course, illegally, or was entering, there anything else? Well, of course, I, I don't know who that is. So I And they arrested 680 people. Uh, so no is the short answer, but coming into this country illegally is a crime. They also, uh, so a bunch of the people, and I don't know the numbers, that ICE arrested already had removal orders, had already been through the very long process of in getting a removal order, and they were disobeying them. Mm -hmm. The folks who were here illegally but had not did not have removal orders, were put in the removal process. And as I'm sure you know, Aaron, about 300 of them were released that day on things on bond and so forth on, for humanitarian bases. For instance, parents who were the only parent in the area to go so pick up their So you're not familiar with her father specifically. No. But, but let me ask you about one, one thing here before we go, Director. She's the and, oldest and, of four and children. Aaron, but, look, but, I'm a former attorney general. There yeah. is no American citizen who gets arrested in this country with, with uh, the kind of consideration we talk about and that ICE provided in that operation okay. statewide in Mississippi last week. One important thing, though, because she's 11, she's the oldest of four children, and all four of them were born in the United States. Their parents came from Guatemala. So if you're going to go ahead with your policy, right? I mean, not, not even the policy you're talking about now, but the policy, right? You're going to say you're here, you're not supposed to be here, um, we're going to send you home. You then have four kids, right, that aren't going to go because they are American. So would you change the Constitution, Director, so that children born to people that are in the United States, illegally, undocumented immigrants, are not U.S. citizens? So every family is going to decide when they have somebody who can't stay in this country where they're going to, whether they're going to separate their own family or whether they're going to stay together. Um, that's a decision family by family. But I, I hold the adults accountable in that situation, and, and right. they're the ones who are going to make those decisions. But the decisions. American taxpayer, if they want their kids to stay, is somehow going to be responsible for those four children, whereas the parents were actually had jobs and were paying for them before. So if you, if you, if you, if you put them in that position, we, taxpayers could be paying more. Well, Aaron, 
you know, we, we can go round and round about various scenarios, and, and of course people do, but the reality is there are base laws in place that Congress put in place, we don't make these things up, and that frankly, for instance, the one we talked about earlier in the public charge rule, were passed on, an ex on a thoroughly bipartisan basis back in the days when immigration was not a partisan issue, and uh, unfortunately it has become so, and, and there are human elements to this, and nobody denies that, but the reality is people charged with enforcing the law don't get to make those decisions. Congress gets to make those decisions, and they're capable of making those decisions. Frankly, we've asked them to make all sorts of changes to the system, and they haven't made any, whether they agree with us or not. And some of what the Trump administration has requested to be fixed are the same things President Obama was seeking to fix.